I would like to thank uh, BIC for hosting this session and inviting me. So uh, what do you tell such an august group and things about which you have read so much? So what I thought is for first 20 minutes, so what I plan to do is uh, talk about things which may not be known in the public domain. That is uh, what happened in the court and what was the set of events that led to uh, this electoral bonds being actually introduced. So two minutes before I get on to this, uh, you know, we started this transparency of political parties back in 2006. So we wanted to know the donations and the audited financial statements of political parties. I will not uh, bore you with the details. It took us four years to get it out from the Central Information Commission. After that, we uh, started studying those reports which the income tax department was giving out. And we were finding that we don't know who is giving how much money to whom. Because the political parties were only putting up that we got so much money. So we went back to the Central Information Commission and said that you must declare these political parties. It's a technical term called public authority under the RTI. So if you're a public authority under the RTI Act, it means that all your information is in the public domain. So therefore, they would have to give information on who is giving them how much money. So we won that case. After that, the political parties refused to comply with it. Then we went back to the CIC. The CIC said, we can't do anything. We are helpless, but we stand by our order. So then we went to the Supreme Court. The matter is still somewhere there in the Supreme Court. So the news was slowly tightening. and So I think that was the background for the introduction of the electoral bonds. So let me just tell you what these electoral bonds are. Uh, I think most of us know what they are, so I'll skip it. Uh, what were the reasons that the government stated in public for actually introducing these bonds? Uh, why did we as petitioners, there were other petitioners, why did we challenge the scheme and on what grounds did the Supreme Court uh, strike it down? So I'm going to uh, restrict my talk to the legal part and the media and the political part, I think our co-panelists will uh, take over from there. And uh, there are two or three questions which are there in the public domain and we will leave it for Q&A. So one of the things the government has been saying is that the electoral bonds would eliminate black money. So did it do so or not? And uh, now, uh, what kind of funding reforms do we need in case we have time towards the end? Yes, electoral bonds are bad. They have been thrown out, but we still need some reforms. What kind of reforms do we need? If there are questions, we can take that up. So uh, very quickly, the legal background, the electoral bond scheme actually uh, included amendments to four laws. The RBI Act, Reserve Bank of India Act, which was passed in 1934, an amendment to the Income Tax Act, 1961, an amendment to the Representation of People Act, 1952-51, and an amendment to the Companies Act, 2013. So four laws were amended to introduce these electoral bonds. Now the scheme is that these laws are passed in Lok Sabha, the lower house first, and then they have to be passed in the upper house, which is the Rajya Sabha. At that time, uh, the government did not have a majority in the Rajya Sabha. So they introduced these amendments in the Rajya Sabha through something called the Finance Act 2017, under which there is a provision for something called a money bill. If you introduce a money bill into the Rajya Sabha, then it doesn't have to be voted. At best, the Rajya Sabha can give some suggestions which will be taken on board. So uh, that was the background. So, so many um, bills were passed. Now, just a small matter which is only peripherally of interest to the electoral bond scheme. We also challenge what is a money bill. So a money bill, operationally, legally I'll tell you later, operationally the Speaker of the House in the Rajya Sabha being the Vice President of India, he or she decides whether it's a money bill or not. But legally under Article 110 of the Constitution of India, 
a money bill has four or five provisions. One is it must include an issue that bears on the sovereign guarantee given by the central government on funds. The electoral bonds had nothing to do with it. Number two, it must be something to do with the contingency or the consolidated fund of India. The electoral bonds had nothing to do with it. Or it has something to do with a tax matter. The electoral bonds had nothing to do with it. So we challenged that it should not have been introduced in the money bill. They clubbed two, three other petitions. And as we speak, a seven judge bench, ours was a five judge bench. A seven judge bench is now hearing whether anything and everything can be passed off as a money bill. So let's see what happens to that. Sorry for the digression. Now, uh, what does the central government say about why they introduced these electoral bonds? Their public statement was that it is going to ensure transparency. The Election Commission of India was asked by the government before they introduced the bill to give its suggestions and comments. And the Election Commission of India incidentally is a constitutional authority. They replied to the government saying that this will reduce transparency and increase the possibility of black money that the representation of people act which you are amending, saying that you do not have to disclose who is giving how much money to whom in the electoral bonds will increase black money and also be impossible for the election commission to trace whether that money is coming from a foreign source or whether it's black money. So therefore the election commission stated in writing which the court also mentioned in its judgment that the uh, electoral bond scheme is not good. Second thing they said is it would ensure secrecy of donors. Now, this is uh, double speak because on in the public domain they were saying it is going to increase transparency. But in writing in court, the Attorney General of India argued in the Supreme Court on this petition that the primary purpose was to ensure donor secrecy. Now, well, you know, this is, uh, we are living in Animal Farm in 1984 all over again. 2024, 1984, I don't know. We'll have to see whether. Now, the another argument which they gave is that people who are giving money want their donations and names to be kept private because they are afraid that they will be harassed if their names are made public. Now the fact is that many people are being harassed, but not by the opposition parties at all. It is by the people who control the CBI and the ED and the income tax authorities who are actually uh, harassing them. So in the absence of, uh, they would have, uh, so this is what they said, in the absence of electoral bond, donors would have no option but to donate by cash after siphoning off money from their businesses. This is gobbledygook because, now I'm saying it deliberately because there are two other options which people don't know about donating money, which is still there. It was there when the electoral bonds were there and after they're struck down, those two options are still there, which is any one of us can write a check or send money online to any political party of your choice. Any company can do that. So you don't, you're not forced to, uh, siphon off your money and give it through cash because you can just uh, donate it to any political party of your choice. And there's another provision under uh, the law which says electoral trusts. So a group of people can form a trust. Typically it is formed by political, I mean by corporate houses and they can receive donations from whoever they like. They can keep 5% of that donation for administrative purposes and within the calendar year they have to donate that entire money to any political party. So five people may donate to an electoral trust or 50 people, they may give it out to three others. So that is also legal, it is available. And just for the record, because they said that they'll have no option but to donate cash by siphoning off, even during the six years of the electoral bond scheme, 55% of the money donated was not through the electoral bonds but through the other two options which I just mentioned. 
So this is masterly double speak because what they stay in public and what are the facts are completely at variance with itself. I mean, with each other. So our reasons for the petition are very simple. Uh, you know, ADR is a non-partisan, non-political organization. We try our little bit to try and improve elections and democracy. And one of the bedrocks of that is transparency. Transparency as much as possible. So we said that uh, these electoral bonds are actually opaque. We don't know who is giving how much money to whom. And therefore, it is unconstitutional. And some of you may not know the law. Under Article 19.1a, which is a fundamental right in our constitution, which means all of us enjoy that Article 19.1a, the technical term is freedom of expression. That means I can talk the way I am, and hopefully I will not go to jail. Or you can write books, or you can make movies, you can hold protests, you can speak, you know. Freedom of expression is a fundamental right under the constitution. And it is a corollary that freedom of expression has no meaning unless you have freedom to receive information. Because if you have no information, you will never be able to express yourself. So the Right to Information Act is very closely derived from that fundamental right of Article 19.1a. And so we argued in the court that since the voters, who are the ultimate, uh, you know, owners of this country, since the voters will not know anything about the political funding, uh, their right under the constitutional uh, fundamental right of 19, Article 19.1a is being violated and therefore you should strike it down. And there is a provision in case some, some of you want to get active, I'll just mention it. Article 32 of the Indian Constitution gives the right to every citizen to seek constitutional remedy from the Supreme Court when they have been deprived of their fundamental rights. So we, the court will say that we have filed it under Article 32 and under this, this is Article 19. Uh, then, yeah, so I had already mentioned that these four acts had been uh, amended. So this I have already gone through, so I will not repeat it. Uh, a little, a few uh, things which may be of interest is, the amended Income Tax Act said that a political party need not keep record of money received from electoral bonds. You know, the Supreme Court didn't agree with it publicly. Because if somebody is giving somebody 20 crores or 50 crores, he is jolly well, he or she is going to tell that political party that I gave you 50 crores. He is not going to say I anonymously gave it for the good of the nation or the good of the society or anything like that. So, I mean, it's not possible. So, the political party, so they said they need not keep a record, but anyway. And they amended, huh? so this is the diabolical part which I think we should know. You see, on electoral funding, uh, there are laws in all countries around the world. And the principle of the law on regulating uh, funding to political parties and campaigns is the following. That no individual or corporation should be allowed to completely hijack elections. I mean, just to put it dramatically, uh, Apple's market cap is about $3 trillion, which is a little less than India's GDP. So can Apple buy up the US Congress and the US Senate? Th theoretically, yes, but the law prevents them from doing it. The law does not allow Apple or any other company to give as much money as they like to anybody and everybody. And such caps on political party funding are there in the European countries and leading democracies around the world. We had them in India too. Up to the 1970s, corporate funding was banned. I don't know if that's good or bad, I'm just telling you the history. Then in the 70s, they said up to 3% of your profits you can give. Then somewhere in the 80s, they made it 5%. A little later in the 90s, they said, 7.5% of your PAT, post-tax uh, profit, profit after tax, you can uh, uh, donate to a political party. And the company should have been in existence for at least three years. This amendment under the electoral bond scheme, they said that you can donate as much money as you like 
no cap is required. So there have been companies, which is a public company, IFB Agro, they gave 92 crores when their PAT was 50 crores. And they publicly said it, that, yeah, we've done that. What the shareholders of that company are doing, whether they have any rights, we have no idea about all. Because this is only information we can get on publicly listed companies. Those which are privately listed, of course, we don't know what they're doing. So this cap was removed. Number two, you don't have to be in existence for three years. So you can set up a company. The technical term they use nowadays is shell company. You can set up a shell company, receive money from anybody and everybody, white, black, green, blue, whatever you call it. And you can immediately donate it to a political party and you need not do any business, nothing. So recently they unearthed some company in Kolkata apparently where 19 companies were registered on the same address. So you must have read all that. So this is what the, this is another thing that the court went into and therefore it has struck this down as also. Now, a little two, three minutes because this is really not known and personally I feel very strongly about it. The Reserve Bank of India is the central bank of this great nation and every country has a central bank. And for all countries, the law is the following. So, you know, so this is a 100 rupee note. It's called a promissory note or a bearer bond. Under the law, 1934 RBI Act, the law says only the Reserve Bank of India has the authority to introduce such a note. They amended the RBI Act. Nothing is sacred. The Indian economy, the Reserve Bank, little bit sacred for the nation, I thought, but maybe not. Nothing is sacred. They amended it and they said that the central government shall be authorized to direct any scheduled bank to issue electoral bonds. They asked the RBI, what do you think of this? Now, this RBI was appointed by the current government as was the election commission which I referred to earlier. Both of them were appointed by the same government that is in power. The RBI went on record, you can read that, would enable multiple non-sovereign entities to issue bearer bonds which is against RBI's sole authority and has the potential of being currency. This is verbatim quote of the objection raised by the RBI in writing to the uh, government. Electoral bonds can undermine faith in banknotes issued by the central bond bank if the bonds are issued in sizable quantities. Though identity of the person or entity purchasing bonds is known by KYC, identities of the intervening personal persons and entities will not be known. This would impact the principles of the Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. So this is what the Reserve Bank of India, another constitutional authority, had to say in writing, objecting to the electoral bonds. Of course, in royal disdain, the government ignored all this and went ahead anyway. No, I'm done, is it? So RBI even said, why do you have to issue an electoral bond? Digital payments are good enough. So they didn't want it. And look at, you know, it would have an adverse impact on public perception about the scheme as also the credibility of India's financial system in general and the central bank in particular. And the finance ministry wrote, writes back saying that the core purpose of the electoral bonds is to keep the identity of the donor secret. I don't know, I am feeling a little provoked. Uh, I will have to switch to Hindi for a minute. Uh, there is a saying in Hindi called Chor Chor Mosere Bhai. <laughs> you know, I don't know how to translate that exactly, but you know, uh, thieves are cousins or thick as thieves or something because they want to protect each other's, um, you know. So this I mentioned what the ele election commission said. You can read that last part. You cannot find out if the political party received donations in violation of section so and so 
of the RP Act, which prohibits the political parties from donations from government companies and foreign sources. In fact, I spent quite some time trying to figure out whether any of the donations were from a public sector unit. They, I think they all go to the PM don't care funds. <laughs> it seems like that. And the ECI, another constitutional body appointed by the government has said in writing, and it, the Supreme Court has quoted it, that unlimited corporate funding would increase the use of black money for political funding through shell companies. So let me settle that point before we move further. One of the big things which is floating around the country today is that, oh, electoral bonds are not so good, but we should have kept them. Because now that they are gone, the old bad system of black money is going to be back in full place and there is no choice now we'll have to live with this terror of black money. I mean, some kind of uh, warped thinking like this going on. So let me tell you the facts. The electoral bonds were introduced in, on January 2nd, 2018. And they were, no, you know, they have windows. In the 2019 election, which was next year, electoral bonds were in full flow. 3,654 crores of cash were seized by the election commission during that election, a record seizure of cash which had never been seen in Indian history before. So if electoral bonds were indeed going to wipe out black money, how come we had a uh, record seizure? So this is all gobelizian gobbledygook which is being put out in the public domain. You know, we should look at the facts and then decide uh, what is uh, what. So let me just close with the judgment. I know I am exceeding my time, but I'll just seek the No, <laughs> he's saying he keeps speaking. Yeah, you know, when I speak like this, people want to listen. When you make sarcastic comments, people want to listen. Yeah, the Supreme Court struck down the electoral bond scheme on February 15th. Our petition had been filed in, actually that should be 2017, I'm sorry. The day they, it was passed in parliament, we, filed a petition, day meaning a couple of weeks later, it was notified by the government in, through a gazette notification in 2018. We filed it in 2017. Till 2023, for six years, the Supreme Court did not hear it. And uh, all the amendments were struck down, the Finance Act was struck down, and they asked the SBI to stop issuing electoral bonds and the SBI to disclose all information on EBS to the ECI. So they explicitly said this is unconstitutional. I mean, just a slight digression. Not only these five, we had the misfortune of getting the representation of people act struck down as unconstitutional way back in 2002 and three also when we had, uh, that is another story, so I'll not go into that. So we have a weapon in our hands. The point I'm telling you is as ordinary citizens, and I can tell you I'm just an ordinary citizen. Many of you have more money than I have because you guys are all running businesses. An ordinary citizen can go to the court and actually get law struck down. But you have to have a little bit of understanding of the constitution and, and you know, all of us are reasonably intelligent. You can read the fundamental rights and move ahead on that. And there are many good lawyers. We don't pay a dime to any of our lawyers, zero. They do it entirely pro bono. The great man who appeared for the SBI uh, whatever his name is, he lives in London or somewhere, some such place. These kind of people, they charge 10 lakhs, 20 lakhs per hearing. 25? 25? 25 lakhs. So I'm being corrected. Thank you. 30? So the disclosure drama, which you probably know, but I'll just close with this. So on 15 February, the Supreme Court said that you shall give this information by the 6th of March, three weeks. Two days before that, on the 4th of March, the SBI ran to the Supreme Court under the same well-known lawyer and said that we need three months more. Well. On the 7th of March, which is one day after the expiry of the Supreme Court deadline, ADR filed a contempt petition. We have something called contempt. What is contempt? Some of you may... If somebody willfully 
disobeys a court order, particularly a Supreme Court order, that organization or person is in contempt of the court. And if you are in contempt of the court, you can go back to the court and say, Your Honor, you passed this judgment and these guys are not listening, so they are in contempt of you, so you can file a petition. So the SBI plea and our plea on contempt were taken up together on the just following Monday on 11th of March and some of it was public and the same day the Supreme Court heard, actually they didn't even bother to hear us, they just heard the SBI and after they heard it in open court, the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice dictated his order on behalf of everybody saying that give it tomorrow yeah. on March 12th. And they gave another two days to the election commission to put it up on its west, uh, website. So the Jollywell gave it on the very next day because they said that we are not inclined to take up the issue of contempt, but if you don't follow second time, we are going to take it up. Now contempt of court, by the way, means that the chairman of the SBI would go to jail. I'm not saying anything sensational, that's the law. Now the SBI, I don't know how many people have SBI accounts here, SBI has 48 crore accounts in India and apparently there are only 25 or 26 crore households in India. It's a national institution. Whether we like it, it's like General Motors for America. SBI is a national institution. We do not want to see the chairman of the SBI going to jail. Anyway, when they gave the information, Suomoto, the court again took it up on the 18th of March, the third time. They are saying, why did you not release the electoral bonds numbers? Now, this some of you may know, some of you may not know. When you see an electoral bond, there is no number on it. But when you read it under ultraviolet uh, light, there is a number on it. You know, not electoral bond, but James Bond. You know, that kind of bond, James Bond movie style. So <laughs> they asked the election, I mean, they asked the SBI, send that data by tomorrow with the numbers. They said, earlier they were saying that it will take them three months to match. You know, there is a set of numbers of the purchasers and there is a set of bonds with numbers of the redeemers. To match this, they said they would take three months. The court said, don't bother about it, just give it out as it is. So they gave it out. It was on the election commission website by 5 p.m. on Friday. By 11 p.m. the same day, in six hours, dozens of analysts, including our small team in ADR, we had matched the entire thing. <laughs> For which they needed three and a half months, the state bank. It's a national institution which I respect because I, my salary comes through the State Bank of India. I wish they, you know, start following the system better. So that is the background and uh, that, that's it. I don't think I'm going to say anything more. Uh, if I have two minutes, no. I think I have said on the major ground is the constitutional. The other thing is Article 14. I'm just saying not nothing to do with bonds. Article 14 is that, you know, exactly, the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India. So, the court said, is Article 14 being violated in this particular case? So, the court went on to argue that when somebody gives an electoral bond to somebody else, both the donor and the recipient know even though it is supposed to be hidden. Because the court refused to buy the argument that, you know, somebody from the TMC said that he put a box outside his office and people were putting 50 crores and 100 crores electoral bonds and so he doesn't know who gave, who, who gave them. The court doesn't buy that kind of stuff. So the court said that both of them know but the public shall not know. So this is not equality. Because the voter is the fundamental aspect of a democracy and if the voter does not know but the political party knows, then Article 14 is being violated. That kind of argument, legal argument they went. It's a brilliantly written judgment. So these are some things which may or may not have been known in the public domain. So rest of it I am going to leave to our other two. Can you show the previous transparency? 
You already have questions. No, you are not going to leave anything to us. We are going to ask you more questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What is this, sir? You had a question. No, I didn't have a question. I didn't read this. Oh, okay, okay. Right. So, uh, with your permission, I'll close here and look forward to the. I'd now like to invite. I'd now like to invite Mr. Kalapa and Mr. Veera Raghav onto the stage to begin the conversation. Yes. Yeah. Happy Holi, everyone. Uh, you know, we are discussing color of money, which is black and white. You are a very dangerous man to sit next to, given that you've unearthed the bonds and, you know, how easily everybody gave out the information is interesting. You were mentioning about the argument given by, in the Supreme Court, and I was listening to it where Mr. Salve said, we have one silo of information where people who bought the bonds, one silo of information to who the bonds went to, and a third silo of information which political party has got it, but we need to match all these three, which, which is what uh, happened. Of course, uh, you all know Professor Shastri now. My friend Brijesh Kalapa, equally dangerous, uh, because, uh, you know, as the old saying, he's na aap ka, na bajab ka, na congress ka, he's his bab ka. <laughs> And he's seen all three, he's seen every party very closely. Um, so, you know, so we'll come to you about how much it actually takes to fight an election and all that. But uh, first question I want to ask you is taking off from where you left, where the Supreme Court said that the company knows, the party knows, but the voter needs to know, which is under Article 14 you said that. Fascinating. But I'm going to ask you from a very pessimistic point of view, why? What consequence do you hope it will have? Given the brazenness that one has seen in several instances, do you really believe that this will be a crucial issue in an election and will impact voter choice and behavior? Actually, the answer is I don't know. But I will elaborate a bit. You see, we are too much in the present moment, whether the coming elections is going to be affected or not. You know, the first war of independence was fought in 1857 and we got independence in 1947. I don't care, but it is good. Public awareness has been steadily increasing. It may take five years, it may take 15 years, but the great Indian public shall know, they shall become aware. And when they do become aware, it will impact elections. Whether it will impact the May elections or not, I have no answer for that. Oh, fascinating point that you make there. You are basically setting the foundations for this, and I will probe a little bit further on the consequence of this as well. But Brijesh, from a political point of view, one has seen this, and I'm just broadening the debate. What does it take to contest an election? How much money is being spent? Because some parties say 40 crores, 50 crores, 80 crores. I mean, you know, just explain that whole thing to us. How much does it actually take for somebody who has to contest a parliamentary election? See, I've been, uh, you know, uh, trying to calculate how much it costs to contest an election. And uh, the, my first, uh, the first time I thought about this was sometime in the 90s, late 90s. At that time, in Kool, where I come from, you required about 50 lakh to contest an election. Then, of course, the uh, famous uh, Bellari mining scam happened. From then on, things kind of just escalated, right? And today, if uh, one were to contest an election from Kool, one would require about 7.5 crore for an assembly election, for an assembly election, and for a parliament election from Mysore constituency, which also encapsulates Kool, I think you should uh, require about 50 to 60 CR. 50 to 60 crores for a parliament. Yeah, and incidentally, you know what the salary of an MP is? It's about 2 lakh rupees a month. Mm -hmm. So you'll be spending... That's the salary without electoral bonds. That's the one that gets transferred online. <laughs> no, but really, uh, I appreciated what uh, Professor Shastri said. But uh, he also made a point regarding the seizures, right? And all this electoral bond money is not actually going into these elections. So if somebody is under the mistaken impression that this 6,000 crore which a political party has received, that goes into cash and then goes to candidates, it's wrong. That never goes as cash uh, because there's a separate channel for 
money spending, cash spending, and that goes directly. So that money is used separately. So the 6,000 or 7,000 crore or whatever it is, is never going to go through that channel. That's another channel. This is yet another channel. The reason why I ask that question is that while we can discuss electoral bonds and while we, while we have fascinating data now, and I wish we can put up that data if you have of how much each political party goes, because I have the numbers with me, 18,000 crores uh, totally and about 8,000 crores of that is for the BJP, around 1,700 crores for the Congress, about 1,700 crores for the Trinamool Congress. Those are the top three that I remember. Now the question that I'm going to pose is, is actually taking the debate for, further this integration of money and politics at some level. You know, often a lot of this becomes WhatsApp forwards. And I remember as a political journalist, um, um, uh, Brijesh, the defining election for me was 2007 Karnataka, which was one election when money started getting spent at crazy levels. Uh, then, and, and this is to say, because that was when the Operation Kamala happened and you had Janardhan Reddy, and, and it's largely accepted that South India has in many things set the record for the rest of the country and South India set the record in terms of spending for elections as well. Karnataka set that record. Then it was 2009, DMK in Tamil Nadu and uh, uh, the Congress in uh, Andhra Pradesh, which was massive spent elections. So the question really is that this is not just in India. You've seen the amount of money spent in an election for victory rise in other countries as well, in the US as well or in the UK as well. If somebody can spend X amount of money and do a great marketing campaign, and if that person's going to be the one who's going to win an election, then are we ever going to be able to beat this idea of money funding for politics? I, I don't know the answer to that. Because uh, I think it, you know, before, as I said, we live too much in the present. And when we see a thunderstorm, we think it's going to go on forever. Yeah. From 1950 till about 1970s, uh, he said 50 lakhs. In those days, hardly one or two lakhs. Of course, there's an inflation issue there. And uh, people were winning elections. So now we are in the middle of uh, this thing where we're spending 50 crores. So, I mean, people will have to think innovatively. See, where is this money spent? I think he will tell us better. But I'm just, uh, you know, since you asked me, I'm responding. One is the candidate will have huge rallies, meetings, then he has got his staff whom he has to pay, uh, transport, etc., etc. Then of course there is a distribution of money, liquor and gifts where Karnataka is setting a record. Now of course the cynics are saying that now people are taking money from every candidate and voting for whoever they like to. It doesn't matter. I have no idea. He will have to tell us what it is. But somewhere it has to max out. So now the we have been telling the election commission, and the election commission is little on the back foot there. The first corrupt act in the Representation of People Act 1951, if you look at the list of corrupt practices, the first one is bribing of voters. So, we don't even know that it is illegal to bribe voters. And it is illegal not only to bribe voters, it is illegal for somebody to receive the vote. Now, the election commission has somebody called an election observer. Uh, somebody from the Indian Revenue Service of the rank of Joint Secretary or above is an election observer in every Lok Sabha election, along with two other IAS officers. And he or she is supposed to look at the elections uh, expenditure. There are tons of reports there. So we have told the election commission that if you find money or liquor being distributed, you should countermand the election. So off the record, one of the previous chief election commissioners told me, Professor Shastri, I'll have to countermand elections in the entire country. So I said, it is worth doing, do it once. So it's not that we have, we can't pretend to be helpless. We've sent a thing to the moon and to Mars and we can't fix this problem. Come on. I mean, we can fix this problem if we want can to. Can it be fixed? Can a candidate without money win an election? One, Just e one election he can win. Because, I mean, that depends on uh, how the electorate perceives that candidate and, you know, good intentions and so on and so forth. One election he can win. But when the next time around, if there is a sense of, 
you know, oh, what have we done? And, you know, the old system is better and so on and so forth. Unless he is able to sell continuous hope, he is bound to lose the next election. Because there have been some good candidates who have won just one election. And after that, they've kind of disappeared. So one election, you can definitely win mm -hmm. with, no, but, uh, with a great degree of goodwill. But if you're only going to be blame the political parties, I think it's unfair. Because I know of, you know, extremely decent people. Actually, uh, there's this political worker who came to me the other day. And uh, he says uh, that uh, he went to a home where there was a Mercedes-Benz parked. And uh, he went and solicited their vote. And the lady of the house, she said, uh, we have 13 votes in our house, right? And there was a Mercedes-Benz par parked, and they had a big business, I think, you know, giving them crores and crores of rupees. So he said, so uh, he was not sure if she was expecting anything. And then she opened up and she said, I require 35,000 rupees. This happened during the recent, uh, you know, Malaysia elections. So if you're going to just blame political parties, I think it's highly unfair. So who should because, be... No, no, ultimately, the point is this, that, you know, people are so sickened. People are so sickened by the whole process. And they say, chalo, hum bhi isme shamil ho jata. I mean, as it is, hum, we are not doing anything great. So let's also, you know, kind of dig in. No, I, I think there are, there are questions that will come on that point of view on who's to blame, but I just want to broaden this. I just wanted to bring this aspect to give a reality feel, but going back to that core of electoral bonds and what you have uh, unearthed from the Supreme Court, given that it was so easy all this while for you to get that information and everybody willingly gave that information so easily, how much do you think we have actually unearthed and how much do you think is still there, uh, you know, which, which needs to potentially come out. Is this the real quantum of it, the 18,000 crores that we see? Is that the real quantum of it? Not at all, not at uh, all. Can, can we get to the questions when we get down there, sir, please? Can we, can we just wait till... We'll get to that, this one. So you just tell me, how much do you think you have actually been able to unearth? Very little. Uh, is this just the tip of the iceberg. It is absolutely a tip of the iceberg. He just mentioned you are going to spend 50 crores. That 50 crores is not in the electoral bonds. It is may not even be through check. It may be cash. Mm. So there is a huge parallel. So what there. would be, what was the most stark, fascinating aspect that you found when you had the data? You know, you worked all this while to get that data. When you saw this data, what did you, what was your first reaction? I mean, you know, what was possibly the biggest anomaly that you found in that? Well, you know, like Sherlock Holmes said, why did the dog not bark? You know, the very famous story. So why are there some names which are completely missing there? I mean, yeah. some names are missing. That was the first thing. Second thing is that... I don't want to ask you which names. <laughs> if you... Uh, no, I'm not asking you. You want to say it, you say it. <laughs> I told you you're a very dangerous man. I have to be very careful. No, no, no. <laughs> One of the parties that... One of these guys belongs to, his leader keeps mentioning those names in public. Anyway, they are... We are, are, hmm? are asking the names. No, no, it's not that. That is one thing which surprised me. Second thing is, barring three, four companies which are publicly listed, you know, Airtel, IFB, Agro, and a few other companies, and of course, Bajaj list of companies, they have actually given small amounts of money. 90% of the money is coming from unknown private companies whose finances are not there in the public domain. A large number of them are in the uh, what we call infrastructure. It could be construction, roads, building, power, all kinds of infrastructure. Now, if you look at it, you know, uh, our lawyer has been going public on it. I don't know the facts so well. Contracts, government contracts are given for infrastructure projects. So the quid pro quo, the Supreme Court actually mentioned quid pro quo. So there are three or four ways. One is straight protection money that uh, you will go to jail unless you buy some electoral bonds and now, you know, there's so, low, so much of data has come out on that. Number two is that you will get huge contracts. Now when you say how does it affect the voter, if I have bought 50 crores of electoral bonds or 500 crores and I get a huge government contract for 50,000 crores. That's it. I mean, I don't have to deliver. You see, we are finding that the metro in Bangalore is continuing 
you know, people are born, they graduate from college, <laughs> and then they even get married, and the metro construction is going on. But this is a government contract given at public money. So that is another thing on the electoral bonds that we find surprising. And uh, the third thing we found is that some companies whose public information is available, they are giving out more money than they earned as profits, which is publicly listed company. Now we have to investigate what about those private limited companies. So private limited companies, there's no shareholder rights, but here there's a shareholder right. I don't know, someone has to go and ask in the court that, you know, how come we are giving away shareholders wealth for electoral bonds. Interesting that you point that out and I'm, Brijesh, just to bring this into context, when you, one of your slides you said it started with 3%, then it became 4%, 5%. I think possibly the Commission Raj, I mean, you know, this is the, this is the way the commissions have increased over the period of time looks, it, it, it sort of, you know, it, it was like an overall thing of how much one can contribute in that sense. Just put this in perspective, is this new? Or has this always been the case? I mean, is it just that we got to know about it now? Because as a political affairs journalist, I don't think I have seen the exact quantum of money that a political party received until this information came out, right? So is this new? Or why is it such an important issue now? Because has it gone beyond a level where it's extremely disturbing? See, I, uh, one, it's uh, come, come again. You know, there were uh, uh, times in the past when this Ayaram Gayaram culture was there and then there was the anti-defection law which was brought in and all that and you know, people criticized uh, the Congress party I, I, and I'm currently no political party, so... Uh, yeah, right now you're not with happen. anyone. So... Uh, we don't know about tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, uh, as far as the Congress was concerned and then, you know, Ayaram Gayaram and then they redeemed themselves largely after the uh, anti-defection law. Now the BJP has uh, currently about 600 or so legislators have switched sides, right, and joined their ranks during the last, I think, five or six years. 600 legislators. Now, if uh, the anti-defection law kind of tried to change things, now things have become worse, right? So, as far as political defections are concerned, this is also something about transparency and honesty and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, it's very important from that point of view. And as far as electoral bonds are concerned, nobody actually thought of something as innovative as this. And then, the, the electoral bond is very interesting because aap chanda lo or danda lo. Right? Chanda lo Danda lo. And there's another scheme. If it's not Danda lo, you don't take business from a political party, you are escaping from the Danda of ED, CBI and IT. So it's, it's very innovative from that point of view. And it's very open. So supposing I have an uh, ED officer breathing down my neck, right? The following day, I just make a normal visit to the State Bank of India, buy an electoral bond, give X amount of money to a political party, and you know, pr probably the ED officer will scurry away. Mm. And this has been done. I've, I've seen, you know, there is uh, a client who kind of uh, did this. Did this. No, many, not one. Yeah, no, my client. Is. Oh, your client. Okay. So you know, so you you were going to say more about the client? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I, I was I was actually waiting. I thought you had the name written down there. Yeah. So we'll 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 move to the question answer session in just two minutes more. I just wanted to ask this question that you've said. You know, this the you know also the comment that you made shows where you're going politically, because that's exactly the Congress spokesperson's comment yesterday as well. The Danda, this is Jairam Ramesh's comment oh, yesterday. Exactly. Yeah, it's there on the front line of all the this. So, so this no, bit. I don't think you said Danda because this is a I no mean, the, the, the three categories so and, and <laughs> <laughs> well, copyright is yours. But finally, before I just open up the to the audience for questions. I go back to that one core question. You say don't see it in present time. The principal political party, the party in power now is saying Abki bar, char so par. If let us say 350 plus 
if the results reflect a 350 plus or a 300 plus and an overwhelming mandate again. Does this mean then this entire exercise is lost? Or do you believe that this is just, this is one part which has to be seen completely in, in you know, in, in, you know, away separately from what we see in terms of electoral political results? We in ADR see it completely separately and we have publicly always said that we want the process of elections, democracy, transparency, voting, awareness, etc. to steadily improve and we are not worried about which party wins. So, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. You had your hand up for a long time now. Uh, my request is, please introduce yourself, uh, keep it short to a question. I mean, yes, if you fight a Supreme Court case and you get more data, you can come down here and speak. But uh, for the moment, question, please. Hello. To the two of them, not to me. Yeah, hi. So, uh, I spoke to my house help in, during the Karnataka election. And she said that she received 1,000 rupees from one political party, I will not name it, right? And I heard on another WhatsApp group that other people also paid the same amount, right? So we are talking about 1,000 rupees per underprivileged person. The total number of people voting in India is going to be roughly 100 crores. So 1,000 into 100 crores is 1 lakh crores. 1 lakh crores per party. Now you can divide, bring it down, you know, say you don't need to, you know, bribe everybody. Maybe you need to bribe only 50% or 60%. We are talking about minimum 60,000 crores per party. So what it seems to me is that this 6,000 crores is just the white portion, right? There is a black portion which is much higher than that, right? We is there a question, you, sir? No, I'm, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm asking. Because I'm we've asking. discussed all yeah. this last Yeah, yeah, now. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm raising the question that is 6,000 crores just the tip of the iceberg? We just asked that question. I think you should listen <laughs> to the conversation, sorry. <laughs> No, yeah, so, but anyway, 6,000, you want to just give a quick response? To yes, the answer is yes, you are right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, because I just asked him that same question that you put up. Please. Yeah. Oh, no, there's somebody with a the mic there already, sir. Yes, please go ahead. So, uh, <clears throat> I want, I have two questions, one for Mr. Brajesh. My name is Saibal. I'm a resident in Bangalore. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you heard what my friend said and you also discussed. I wanted to ask you, Mr. Rajesh, does, you know, this distribution, does it really uh, guarantee you the votes or, you know, does it uh, give you that confidence of votes? Because I have also heard similar stories from our, you know, domestic help, etc. This question to you. My question to uh, Professor uh, Shastri is, uh, on a different note, you know, the budget that we spend on election in our country, now, is that something you have looked at? Uh, is that something which is within standards uh, compared to other similar sized countries? Thank you. Right. A British one. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, uh, uh, if say a voter has received a thousand rupees from a political party, B voter has received a thousand rupees from B political party, and C has received from C political party, and they're all members of one family, right? So what they usually do is, if they, it's a three-member family, the three political three persons decide that look, I vote A, you vote B, and you know, uh, I vote C. So there is some kind of fairness in the whole process. <laughs> but but no, this is the in so far as you know what you're speaking about the maid servants and so on and so forth. But in so far as the middle class is concerned, they will vote whom they like to, and they will receive the money. And middle class is actually taking money today. Yeah, just to add that on, sorry, I, I don't have real life experience on this, but I've heard from a couple of sitting MPs right now, I don't want to name them, but they told me very categorically that you see there was this, in, I don't know how many of you observed Tamil cinema, there was this Sarvana stores, there was this guy who owned it and he was put into the movie. 
So this politician came and told me when I asked him the same question, what is the correlation between money and victory? He said, see, you need to have a basic star, a decent script, and then you need the money to produce the film. If you don't have the star and script and you just pump money, you're not going to get the results. Yeah, your question was about, uh, I don't know, completely. Your second question, sir? The spending, uh, you know, in the election in our country, and uh, whether, uh, you know, that sort of compares to... Ah, correct, correct. Yeah. See, see, we are only going by media reports. I'm sure a lot of people have seen this. So based on the kind of estimates that uh, our co-panelist and our friend at the back said, you know, some way of estimating the... They said that in 2019, we spent more money in India than in the US presidential election. Now, the US economy is, I don't know, how many times bigger than India's. So, yes, we are spending uh, way too much money in the elections. And uh, what do we need to uh, do to control it? Uh, I don't think there is any silver bullet. It is, again, a long, drawn affair. So, we have to work on supply and demand. So, one is, of course, uh, supply meaning the election commission, the police, the legal authorities, the flying squads, they'll have to catch those people who are uh, this thing. Number two, we do need to launch a big campaign on voter awareness. So, I just saw the other day, we had started this with one of the well-known film stars, one of the three Khans. And he said, Apnae bachchon ka bhavishya kitne ke liye bechuge? Matlab. How much will you sell your future of your children for? For one sadi or 1,000 rupees. And then, you know, you're suffering. Roads are not working. Flyers are not working. Teachers are not coming to school. The government hospitals are not working. So, you're, uh, it is a ghate ka sauda. Means you're getting 1,000 bucks and getting cheated for, you know, government services worth this thing. So, that voter awareness. Now, the other Khan has also come out with a video. So, this is an ongoing process, sir. Raising voter awareness, that is on the demand side and on the supply side, clamping down. This is the only method that I can think of. If you have any suggestions, let us know, we'll implement them. Just to add to the point that he's making and this I had, in fact, I wanted to post this to you. A candidate who won an election to the House of Representatives in 1990 spent at an average dollar $407,600, equivalent to dollar. 913,000 in 2022, if you adjust it money-wise. While the winner in 2022 in the US spent on an average $2.79 million. In the state av Senate average spending for winning candidates went from dollar 3.87 million, 3.87 million in 1990 to 26.53 million in 2022. So just putting that comparison, and I'm sorry, I'm just going to, you know, ask you that question again. This seems to be a global trend and you know what worries me is that there is a strong correlation between money and people's choice behavior. When, when, when a candidate spends enormous amount of money. So is it time that we need to reinvent or rethink democratic processes itself, the entire process of an election? Because if people and the mind is going to be influenced by the amount of money that you're going to spend, especially in an internet world, where the amount of information you can pump out with your financial resources can often dominate the mind space of people. And there has been studies which have shown that the divide, the divide between those who don't have money and those who have money is much greater in the internet world, right? Because the one with money has greater power and resources to pump information out use the technology to pump information out. What is your does, question? So my question is, does that worry you that this correlation is so strong between money and this? And if this correlation is so strong, will we, be ever, will we ever be able to beat this kind of funding for political parties? See, this is the third time I'm saying, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a futurologist. I don't have a crystal ball, like how the world is going to evolve and how people... I have no clue, boss. I've learned my lesson. Now <laughs> let's go to the next question. Yes. We did the left, let's go to the right. Yeah, uh, unless my name is Vivek, I'm also from the same apartment block. So, you know, we are quite. Uh, somehow in your agenda, I noticed that you said, what is the way forward? Uh, somehow I missed that point, unless something. I'm no, mistaken. I did not. I was waiting for questions on that. Okay. The, the second point is that, uh, you know, in all democracies, people do give money for a quid pro quo. 
with this yes. NRA or thing, everybody knows yes. that. Yes. To expect that not to happen, I think, is a little being a little too simplistic. That, that's what my view is. The second thing is that if I have a turnover of 400 crores and my turnover, and I give a, a, a check for 1,500 crores, I don't think it, that covers is in the ambit of the electoral bonds, basically. It's I mean, none of your, anybody's business for, I mean, except maybe the Income Tax, the Companies Act, to come to, uh, come to some sort of understanding. So that's my, my point of view, really, on that. So you're, according to you, quid pro quo is fine, and we should yes, not? Yes, yes. Well, we'll have to just disagree. According to me, it's not fine. <laughs> that's OK with me. But the future yeah, way for a long to... discussion. Yeah, sure. It's uh, just not I'm acceptable. Happy to discuss. World over, United States is a perverted example. United States is not the only country in the world. Mm. There are 28 countries in the European Union who do not allow this kind of gobbledygook. They don't okay. allow people to fund for quid pro quo. It's not allowed. Any. And just today, Finland was voted as the happiest country in the Come world. On. I don't know whether that's true or not. India had a, had a, had a thing of no, 100,000 people only on Finland. I don't agree with you. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. I want to uh, switch slightly to the sources of funds. If you say uh, for a uh, member of parliament election, you mentioned 15 or 16 crores. 5-0. 5 okay. I was told that it's something more like 15, okay? But whatever the number. 5-0 crores. I'm saying more like whatever. The official amount that they are allowed to raise is 75 lakhs, right? Increase now, 95. Or 95 lakhs. The rest of it has to come from somewhere. I'm told that the party provides some part of it in cash, but the bulk of it they have to still find from somewhere else. This obviously means that they have to look for quid pro quos, raise money from whoever is willing to give it to them. What prevents us from allowing officially the whole amount? Yeah. Right? And, and, and limiting, as you said, individuals from not have paying, giving more than, let's say, 5% of that amount. So that even if there are quid pro quos, they are spread over 20 people in 20 different ways. And, you know, you have transparency the whole officially. Thing transparent. That's what you're saying. Yeah. So what prevents that? I'm told it's entirely for the parliament to decide the amount. And they are keeping it low and then saying, I have to take black money. Okay. <laughs> No, I can uh, see we have looked at the data from 2004. What you are saying is absolutely correct. The candidates have to file a statement with the Election Commission of India giving details of how much election expenses they incurred. And year, election after election that we have monitored not only for Lok Sabha elections but every assembly election, I think there are two, three instances out of tens of thousands of candidates who have agreed that they crossed the limit. Otherwise, they are somewhere at the 50% mark. So officially, they are spending less than the limit. But unofficially, they are spending 50 crores, I, I believe, now. So there, there, so there is a hypocrisy there. Now, uh, in public speak, they say the election commission should be realistic. Actually, the election commission sets the limits after consultation with the political parties. And the political parties can pass a law and say that we don't want any limit. We want full transparency. It's up to them. And I think they have got comfortable with the current system of operation. They know how to play this game. They don't want to start learning how to play a new game. So they're happy with this. Sorry, just to add to this point and correct me if I'm wrong, Brijesh, this 15, you know, there are different kinds of seats. There are seats where the party wins. And those seats, they don't spend money. Uh, in Karnataka, if you take an Uttar Kannada or a Dakshin Kannada, which is, you know, which the you know, which is not considered a hard contest seat. It's the hard contest seats where the spend is huge. I mean, let's say something like a Ballari, where, where you'll have a hard contest seat where both sides, that's where the money gets spent. So there's no one standard. And I do know that there are some left leaders who tell me that they've won elections with 15 lakhs, 20 lakhs also. No, in so far as spending during a parliament election is concerned, it's much less as compared to a state election. A state election actually costs much more because uh, if, if a state election were to cost you in Bengaluru, uh, and uh, in Bengaluru city, you have 28 constituencies. Of these 28 constituencies, the average spending is 25 crore plus per MLA seat. I mean, if it's a serious contestant, right? So, and uh, 
you know, we, of course, it depends on the from from constituency to constituency. But can, can I respond to the gentleman who yeah, said please. he doesn't have a problem with uh, quid pro quo? Quid pro quo, actually, why I'm concerned about quid pro quo is for this reason: that I receive as a political party X amount of money for my own political party, and give the gentleman who has given me X amount of money access to public funds. So this is the problem with quid pro quo. So he gives me some 25 crore, but he gets access to 5,000 crore of public funds. This is the problem. I, I, I honestly don't know how somebody could, can say that, you know, yeah. quid pro quo is okay. I'm, I'm really appalled by that because it pains me that, you know, <laughs> quid pro quo is not okay. And let me tell you, actually, you see, uh, it's, a, it's a pet theory. I don't know, I'm just testing it for the first time. If I say, if, if I have 50 crore in my bank today, Right? And if I decide that I am going to fund X party for political spending and I grow this corpus to say 5,000 crore over the next 5-10 years, right? And I decide that I am going to own the Karnataka State Assembly, right? For, for, uh, for each MLA I pay 50 crore and he, he operates on terms which I set for him. I have 5,000 crore. That gives me, 5,000 crore gives me access to 3 lakh crore which the state budget has. If I have, I have 200 MLAs, don't you see that? And much more in terms of and natural resources. So, you know, when you allow for the East India Company to come in, and I'm speaking of my own little enterprise, but if you allow for a foreign enter, enter, enterprise to come in and say that, look, I'm going to conquer India, I have to, all, all I have to do is access, I have access to 300 MPs. It's finished. What's left of India then? But if you are okay with quid pro quo, then this whole conversation is meaningless. <laughs> right. the, uh, one of the questions the court asked during the hearings, I am told, is whether the bonds are tradable. And while uh, technically under the scheme they are not, in practice there is nothing that prevents someone from giving KYC details, buying a bond, and then selling that bond for cash or whatever to a second party, who then can go negotiate his own quid pro quo. And probably that's the reason for the conspicuous absences you mentioned that are there in the list. So what's the strategy for uncovering that sec? No, electoral uh, bonds of are unconstitutional, they're gone. So we don't have to worry about no, them. But for the history of what has happened, is, is there any odds of that data? It is possible and people did mention what you're saying that there could be a grey market or a secondary market for trading. And the Reserve Bank mentioned that it is against the provisions of the PMLA, Prevention of Money Laundering Act. But anyway, I think it's, uh, you know, the, there are no more electoral bonds, so that's out, I mean, that's finished. That's also for the moment, or are we little worried about future? No, they can try to pass a bill again, but so far. Uh, hi. Yeah, I'm Gauri. Um, the Supreme Court judgment dealt with unlimited corporate funding. Uh, as though corporate funding itself on the basis of it is fine. Um, I just wanted to know what you thought about that. As an economy, just because a corporate entity participates in the market, is it okay that they then um, impact elections? No, I think we've already gone into the question. He has answered it brilliantly. It's not okay. It's not okay. He said that. Why? Uh, just to say, then should we not have uh, corporate funding at all? Is that where we're going is my question. No, no, no. See, this is a very, we are not going to be able to sort this out <laughs> sitting here. There have been several commissions, the Law Commission, the Constitutional Working Committee, I don't know what all commissions have gone through this question of political party funding, the Election Commission. There are a whole set of recommendations going through all the pros and cons of our own country and what is best practice internationally. So I would suggest that you read them because or we can discuss it offline. We will not be able to say so clearly this or that, that uh, whether corporate funding should be banned or not. There is a whole issue of public funding, there is an issue of transparency, and uh, there are limits to corporate funding not only in India but around the world. Not only in India. So all these things have to be put in place. If I may add to that, uh, just that, you know, I think as far as corporate funding is concerned, like they say, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Let it be done under absolute sunlight. Let everybody know what the deal is about and what one is getting, what one is giving. Let everybody know about it. So the moment you kind of do it in darkness, 
that's where the kind of bacteria kind of grows. So this this brings me to another question. Sorry, uh, we'll just yeah. Um, I have a question on electoral politics, and uh, I don't know if it's easy to change, uh, but um, I think in Europe, for example, I think there's proportional representation, right? And the challenge also, I think, is uh, the electoral system today has uh, first past the post in India, which leads to challenges. I mean, in the US, they have the same, which leads to problems with gerrymandering and also to some extent with transparency and election funding. Uh, but what success, what I feel successfully uh, some parties have done in the US, and this is where I need your opinion, is if you have proportional representation, smaller parties, which in some sense of what Bridges said, that um, they can win one election, but they can also force the other parties to respond. For example, I think uh, in Europe, the Green Party has done that successfully, uh, I believe to some extent. So what are your thoughts on the challenges that are there structurally in the electoral politics when it comes to first past the post versus like proportional representation? How much time do I have? Because the important question, yeah, please go ahead. it'll take some time. See, about 21 out of 28 European countries have the PR system as you have mentioned. In India, <coughs> uh, in the 2014 election, if I'm not mistaken, the Bhaujan Samaj party was party in India after the BJP and the Congress nationally and they got zero, zero seats. So it's for these reasons that because their votes were thinly spread over all over India. So it is for these kind of reasons that people say we must have a PR system. Now I'll just give you some facts and you decide because I'm not going to give you my opinion. Again, the Justice Jeevan Reddy Law Commission in the early 90s, the Justice M.N. Venkata Chalaya who is our own Namma Bengalurian and one of the most brilliant people I know, former Chief Justice of India, his commission to look at the working of the constitution, they have all gone into these questions of what is the best system, including the PR system, and they have given their recommendations. So it's up to the government to act on them. So apart from the PR system, which you have mentioned, there is a French system, which is the... Uh, anybody who wins has to get at least 50% of the votes. There is the American system, which is the presidential system. So the chief minister of Karnataka will be directly elected, not indirectly elected right, like now. And then you have uh, the Indian and British system. There is a fifth system, which I personally have been pushing for, uh, for a long time. There are some technical details. You see, this bitterness in our country is bitterly di divided. I am sure 80% of the people sitting in this room have dear friends, cousins, family members and we secretly think how the hell can he talk like this and how, how dare he? I thought he was a good chap, I knew him from childhood and now he's talking nonsense. So if the country is divided within the family. Now why is this happening? Because politics is divided. Why is politics divided? Whether it is PR, French, etc. Now if you have, you know, the simple is 100 divided by 3 is 33.33. If you get 34% of the votes, you are elected. How many people at most can get elected in one constituency? Two. Now if I am fighting you, if I have to beat you, I will abuse you, I will spend money, I will call you a dog, I will call you a communal, I will call you this language, all sorts of things I will say and sully the atmosphere which spills over into our families and WhatsApp groups. But if I have to get only 34%, why the hell I should I spend so much money? Why should I rack my brain abusing you? I will just try to get those 30 you, you and I can both go to parliament. So this system used to exist in India, multi-member constituency in a few selected areas. Japan still has multi-member constituencies. I think we need a system, little innovatively, which unites the people, which stops divisions in society. And you know this western model of winner take all. I get one vote more than you, I am the winner and the rest of the people in the constituency who voted for me, uh, voted for you, who were the loser, let them go to hell. This winner take all is not democracy. It is anti-democratic. We should... <laughs> so we need to think innovatively and PR is certainly one of the ways. You have a question? Next. We say Vasudhaiva Kutumba come and I can't tolerate the chap in my own family, you know, <laughs> because that's how it is. I mean. uh, just a very conceptual uh, question. Uh, can you hear me, sir? 
Yeah. Uh, see, right to information is a constitutional right. Now, as a donor, do I have a right to confidentiality? And uh, supposing I want to re remain anonymous, uh, so I don't want a name to be disclosed. So uh, how, how do you protect yourself? You see, the Supreme Court went into this question. You know, if you are interested, you know, it's a brilliantly written uh, judgment. It's available. This you just read it. He goes the the Supreme Court goes into that question that you have raised. Now it says they go of course constitutionally and legally, not in terms of what is morally right. Or they say the right to privacy versus the right to information, and then they say that the right to privacy is protected under these conditions that uh, you will be subject to defamity, you will be subject to abuse, uh, your public reputation will go or your life will be in danger, or your livelihood will be in danger, all those tests are there. As per that, just declaring that information is not harming any of your basic rights in the opinion of the Supreme Court. And they are also saying that we have to balance these two. And in a democracy, this right to information is more important than this. So that's the Supreme Court's uh, verdict. Uh, I'm not going to go into a discussion on whether they are right or wrong. Yeah, my name is Mohan. I'm just talking, I mean, listening to all this talk about corruption and, uh, you know, uh, electoral bonds. Would the government's uh, initiative of one nation, one election be a step in that direction? No, no, we in ADR are officially opposed to it. There yeah, are a lot of reasons for why? it. It's too complex, sir, because, you know, they have, you see, the same government broke the Maharashtra government, they were going to break the Bihar government, they just buy up 20 MPs from here and there, MLA, this government changes, that government changes, the Supreme Court has to go, at 3 o'clock in the night, the government is... Karnataka. Huh? It started with Karnataka. Yeah, all these things are happening, there is no stability. The, the, see, the, I would not go by these slogans. This uh, government and previous governments have been past masters of slogans. What they state public, they have stated publicly that electoral bonds would increase transparency, and lot of people bought that. This is not going to increase stability, sir. It is going to make things worse. See, I, uh, my view with regard to one election, one nation, and all that. It actually began like that. The first election had a state-wise election also. It began like that, and then. Somebody's term is cut off. Somebody has a, you know, uh, term is cut off by six months. So naturally, then elections became, got, you know, conducted at different times. Of course, that's a very good idea, but it's not possible because at some point in time, who's going to give up six months of their mandate or two years of their mandate? Which government is going to give it up? No government is going to give it up. So of course, it's nice to speak about in the drawing room, but it's impossible to kind of really bring it into activity. Your larger point is uh, too many elections and a stable government, right? Mm -hmm. We need that. I agree with you. And there are, we have to figure out mechanisms for doing that. So one mechanism, which I don't want to name him publicly, but a former Chief Justice of India said, is that there can be no, no confidence motion. If you have a no confidence motion to bring down a government, along with that there should be a confidence motion. At the same time you have to elect the new chief minister. You cannot just pull him down. They both have to be done simultaneously. So okay, one guy goes, the other guy comes, but for five years they continue. No. So a lot of mechanisms have to be thought about. But this Joomla, you know, big slogans and all is, you know, one nation, one station master, one nation, one pujari, inaugurator of temples. You know, this kind of one nation is not going to go. <laughs> We get to the last question. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Um, We're wrapping up. This is the last yeah. question that we'll have, right? Okay, one and I must be. Okay, quickly. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I just want to know. I mean, it may be a naive question. So what do you see will happen from here? Now that the data is out, what would you rather like to see happen? And the second question is: Besides funding organizations like yourself, what can a common citizen do? to help this process. Brilliant. I will go by the second one, uh, of course. Uh, no, if you don't want to fund us also, I'll understand, but please do. Actually, I feel a democracy becomes stable not by changes coming from Supreme Court or Parliament or Election Commission 
or from some chota mota organization like ad or others it is when more and more people engage with democracy and how to get engaged well at a simple thing is spread awareness as as much as possible uh, the only thing we say is that we spread opinions and ideology is in the name of awareness from adr side we try to stick to facts because ultimately your credibility depends on the facts that you are putting out so try to spread awareness as much as possible in whichever way we can discuss it online the more people you know who are aware of various issues that impact elections democracy and therefore their own lives the better this country will be so the first part of the question is what do you hope will happen after this and apart from ah, funds for adr for for the uh, electoral bonds actually we it is we uh, hit a jackpot because we thought that they will just strike it down as unconstitutional and that would end but the supreme court actually went ahead and said that please release all the information now that the information is out what we would ideally hope is that you know the chief minister of delhi is in jail because they did some investigation and on let us give the benefit of doubt to the investigative agencies that yeah maybe there is some prima facie evidence there is so much prima facie evidence in the electoral bond so each and every of those company should be investigated why should they not be investigated and we should find out uh, you know whether it is white money black money uh, shell company this and that all they should be uh, investigated and people should be held accountable for it that's what we would hope for thank you so much i must thank all of you for not asking questions on the media um, really grateful because i don't have answers for those and it's possibly reflection that people don't care about the media anymore huh so but thank you thank you professor shastri thank you brijesh uh thank you all for being here i'm sorry if i cut you short rudely my friend at the back uh, i was told very clearly only questions no opinion thanks i